Hello, I'm David Daly. I'm going to talk today about change point detection and software performance testing. I work at MongoDB. At MongoDB, we develop database software. We'd like to understand the performance of that software and know when it changes, so we do a lot of testing around that. Now, what we really want to know is how that performs as our developers add new features and fix bugs. We have hundreds of developers who are constantly committing changes to the software. And we want to know if those changes uh, impact the performance. We want to know if and when the performance changes. If it gets slower, we want to know so we can fix it. Uh, if it gets faster, we want to know also so we can lock in those improvements. We love getting things faster. Uh, and we do that by testing in CI, in our continuous integration system. We already have a continuous integration system for testing for correctness and building the artifacts. It makes sense to include it in the same infrastructure. And this is really part of our release process. Before we let a new version of the software go out the door as a release, we want to know how it performs. We want to know if it's faster so we can advertise that, if there's any significant regressions so we can fix them, or if we don't fix them, at least notify customers so we can work around them. Um, so the earlier we can find these regressions, the easier it is to fix, and the lighter weight our release process is. So what do you need in order to test performance in a continuous integration system? Well, we need to set up the system under test. We need to run the workload, report the results, then decide if the performance changed and visualize the results and automate everything about it and do our best to keep the noise down. So this talk is really focused on deciding if the performance changed. Uh, we've talked in other places about some of the other steps and I have some links at the end of the, uh, the talk for that. But this one is really about how do we really do our best to decide and alert when the performance changes. So when we first started doing this, we used humans for it. It's not automated, um, but it works. So we had humans go through trend graphs, looking through the graphs for any changes. And if there was, uh, we'd open up a JIRA ticket and we'd work on it. So what does that look like? So some of the graphs look like this. This is a nice flat graph. You might notice that it's not completely flat. There's some noise in there. All the graphs have some noise in it. Computers are noisy things. Uh, we've done what we can to contain the noise, but there'll be noise. Uh, this is a nice flat one. You can stare at it for a little bit and realize nothing's really changing here. And I'd like to point out all of the graphs I'll show you, the assumption is that a higher graph is better performance. We're measuring throughput. We want higher is better on these graphs. So if it goes up, we've made something better. If it goes down, we've made something worse. Okay. So here's another graph. Uh, and it's pretty easy to see that in early August, there's a drop. And then there's a later in August, there's a fix, actually to a higher level. Um, so this one's fairly easy to diagnose also. Human's probably going to catch this. So that's great. But what about a graph like this? Here, because I put just the one graph in front of you, you hope we can very easily see the small drop in performance at the beginning of August. So it's clear here by itself, but imagine that you have to go through hundreds of graphs before you get to this one. Are you going to catch it? I don't know. There's a good chance, I think, that someone misses this one when going through hundreds of, of such graphs. And so, you know, as we go through these, our eyes start to glaze over. Um, how often do I have someone look at it? That goes directly into how quickly I can open up a ticket and get, uh, get someone working on a fix. So we very quickly wanted to move away from having humans in the loop or having them so centrally in the loop. So the next iteration of the system, we went for a simple thresholded system. We compared everything to a baseline. If the performance drops more than 10% from the baseline signal. Um, so for our existing continuous integration system, we have a way of doing that. 
on a correctness test, if it fails, we turn the test, we mark it as red. So here we'll mark the test as red if it falls more than 10% from a baseline. So how does that do with the cases we had before? So our first case works real nice. None of these changes are more than 10%. It doesn't signal anything. No one needs to look at it. Great. All right, what about this case? Well, we had a drop in a recovery. The, the drop is more than 10%. The system will flag it. It'll mark the box red. Great, we can go work on it. Uh, the system only looked at drops, so it's not going to mark the recovery. That's probably okay in this case because we'll have a ticket and we'll be looking actively at this test. But it'll miss cases, in which case where we had an improvement, but we didn't have a drop before. You know, just a, a true improvement. Okay, so this is better. Uh, what about for our smaller drop that we showed? Well, it may, if that drop is large enough, it may find that drop on uh, in the beginning of August. But what about these two other drops that I've uh, marked? Chances are if the threshold is small enough to catch the drop at the beginning of August, it's also going to flag these two other drops as, as red, as failed, and someone's going to have to look at it. So that's not good. That, these are false positives in here. And finally, what if I show you graphs like this? Here we have two tests that run right after each other. Notice the first one, it's nice and stable, but it has a fair amount of noise. And the lower one, it has some small changes. So what threshold do I pick that, that doesn't signal constantly on the top graph, uh, but does catch the small increase uh, on the first arrow. In fact, we're not going to, the small increase on June 13th, um, but then not completely fail about on the increase in noise that happens late in July. Uh, I don't think there is a th threshold that satisfies all those conditions. The, the noise there on that bottom graph after July is higher than the signal in the other two places. And so, you know, you can do things where you adjust the threshold per test, and we did, uh, but it's not, it's not great. So where does that leave us? It leaves us that with, in practice, th using thresholds is awful. It's an awful system, uh, but much better than version zero. Uh, to reiterate the problems, we had a lot of false positives. Some tests are just noisier than others, and finding the threshold that that makes them both happy is hard. We have lots of false negatives because we miss any change that's less than the threshold we pick. Uh, and I didn't show you, but it can also identify regressions at the wrong time. Uh, so if you have, say, a drop that's less than the threshold, say an 8% drop, but a week later you have some noise or another small drop, it can take you across the threshold and now you've rightfully marked that something's changed, but you've marked it at the wrong place. And a human has to spend a fair amount of time trying to figure out exactly what happened and when. So we used this as a time to, to take a step back and reevaluate what we're really trying to do. And what we're not trying to do is tell if the performance changed more than 10% or not. That's what we were doing, but it's not the goal. The goal really is to know when it changed, and then when it changed, how much. So we, we formalized our problem as detect which commits change the performance of software, and in the presence of noise. And when you get down to it, that's a change point detection problem. So here's the definition of change point detection as taken from uh, a, a paper that we used. Um, it's the process of detecting distributional changes within time-ordered observation. That's exactly what we have. We're running tests regularly. We have time-ordered observations, and we want to know when the distribution changes. So this paper is really about how we've used change point detection to fix our problems. And we used an algorithm called e-divisive means as our change point detection uh, algorithm. 
We used it based on reading that we had done at the time. It seemed like the most promising uh, algorithm for us, and it's worked very well for us. But the choice of algorithm itself isn't essential. We can plug in any algorithm at this point. Uh, we haven't done a lot of searching because, frankly, it made our system so much better. We have other problems to work on. So what do we need to do to support change point detection in our system? Well, there's three things largely. We need to calculate the change points, um, which requires a little bit of a change in process because it's not just comparing points, but it needs to have the time series of data. Um, that, frankly, is a little bit more mechanical, but we talk about it a lot in the paper, uh, and we've shared our implementations of it. You need to visualize the change points. The previous system very happily just marked individual tasks as red and green, and that was very simple. We're detecting with a delay because it's detecting distributions, so we need to do something different, and so we want to put it on the trend graph. And finally, we need to figure out how to triage it. Again, we can't just use red and green boxes like we did in the past. We need a different way to triage it. So for visualization, we updated our trend graphs as such. Uh, so if you look at these graphs, you can see two things. First, the change points are highlights on the graph. The bold green lines on there, those are the change points. And in fact, if I hovered over those in my display, it would tell me information about the, uh, about the change point what happened to the mean, the standard deviation, uh, all sorts of statistics about it. Uh, the other annotation on there are the diamonds. The diamonds represent JIRA tickets that have been open related to this, to this change. And so we can see by a glance at the graphs that there's a ticket. Uh, it's being worked on. We, if we hovered on the diamond, we could get a link and go directly to the ticket and see exactly what the status of it is. If there wasn't a diamond, I would know that there's a change here, but it's not being worked yet and it needs to be followed up. And you can see on the lower graph, that was my small change that I showed before. You can see that it exactly found a change on the given change that we wanted. So there's a change point in the right place. We have a ticket, so it's being worked. Um, but also, we don't have change points on the other problem drops that I'd pointed to. The algorithm was smart enough to be able to see that those weren't distributional changes, and it just did not flag anything there. Next, uh, to triage. As I said, we're not turning the uh, tests red or, or green like we do for the correctness tests, or how we did previously for the performance tests. So we need to present something for someone to triage. And so we, we put this page together. It aggregates all the change points. So technically, there's a change point uh, possibly per every test that's run and every version of the test that's run. So we aggregate them all together by, uh, by version, what version of the server it was testing. So we can see. Uh, how big, how wide impacting or aggression is or isn't. And we can sort it by, uh, by how big the changes were. So we have a dedicated person. They can go through, uh, sort based on the severity, and go through and process all the change points. And by processing, what we need to do is determine, is this a real change that someone can work on? Is it noise that should be ignored and hidden? Uh, and handle it the appropriate way. If it's a real issue, they'll open a ticket, uh, they'll assign it out, um, might do some work to isolate it to get it down to a specific commit. We, with the performance tests, we can't run them on every single commit. So when we have a regression, really, uh, say we run our test once a day, there could be tens or hundreds of commits, well, probably tens of commits that ran in the meantime that it could be. So the person who's looking at this will go bisect that and find the exact commit that, that it ran. And the page will update with that updated information as it runs. 
So what's the impact been? Does it work? And it's a resounding yes. This has been a real game changer for us. Um, qualitatively, the human can process all the results. Before, we had a dedicated person looking at all the notifications from the threshold, but it really was a soul-crushing experience. There were so many false positives to go through, and they couldn't keep up. Uh, we're finding changes of smaller magnitude than we did before, uh, which is great. We can find we can find big things, we can find small things, we can get them all fixed. And because the human can keep up, we're finding changes faster. And when you can find changes faster, you can fix things faster. And it's not just that you're starting to work on it sooner, it's that it's actually less work to fix a regression when you find it sooner, because there's less changes that have gone on since then. The developer has the changes in their mind, they know what it is, other things haven't been built upon it yet, it's just easier to do. And finally, we're re recognizing improvements. Uh, this has two great impacts. One, it's great for me uh, to be able to tell a developer, hey, you made software faster. And it's great for them to be able to tell, to have that positive recognition. They work hard on it, they're proud on it, and proud of it, and it's nice to have that recognition. Less obviously, we also find bugs this way. Sometimes things get faster because we removed code that was important. You introduce a bug and it's a lot faster to do the wrong thing than the correct thing. And so we've actually found bugs by flagging when things got faster. So also a very useful thing. Quanti those are all qualitative. Quantitatively, uh, it's also much better. Um, we did a POC, when we did the POC, uh, using change point detection didn't miss any real changes. Uh, so it caught everything from the old system plus more new things. Uh, it was strictly, strictly better in all cases. And once we put it up into production, we went from a case where less than 1% of the notifications led to actionable work to a case where two-thirds of them do. So we're really getting useful signal out of it. Uh, we have some more numbers in the paper, but these are the, the biggest hitters here. Um, as I led on the last slide, though, the system works. It's been game-changing for us, but there's more to do, and we would love uh, to work with the academic community on it. So, so please work with us. We have at MongoDB, we have real world problems and we'd love to work with you. And to support that, we've been talking more about our work. We have, uh, have some links uh, down here. We've had some uh, blog posts on what we did to reduce the noise in the system. We talked about how our infrastructure, in fact, on Monday uh, at uh, the LTB workshop, I'll be talking about the high-level view of how we test performance at MongoDB. Our, so, our source code is open. Uh, here's two links. The signal processing algorithms used in this paper are linked, as is our infrastructure code, which we just opened up, uh, our infrastructure for running performance tests. Our regression environment, Evergreen, is open. Uh, you can see all the correctness tests that run, and the platform itself, uh, Evergreen Software, is open source. Um, not everything is open, though. Our performance data is not open right now, uh, but we are working to share that with academics, and uh, we're breaking down the, the walls to do that uh, and do it in a way that you can publish about it. We want you looking at our data and making our systems better. And so uh, if you're interested, please reach out to me. Uh, glad to talk about things. And uh, that's it. I uh, look forward to hearing your questions on Tuesday when we do the, uh, the live question and answer, and I'll see you then.